All right. Today's guest is just awesome. Dr. Abby Lev is a psychotherapist, mediator, author, and executive coach in San Francisco Bay Area. She's the director of the Bay Area CBT Center. It's a clinic that specializes in cognitive behavioral therapy, which is what we're talking about today. Have you guys done CBT? Are you familiar with CBT? I was vaguely familiar with CBT, but didn't know a lot about it. Now, after this episode, I'm like, this stuff is awesome. (laughs) Okay. So It's all about helping you break unhelpful patterns, get healthier habits, improve all areas of your life. It's really like, I love it because it's like taking you right in the moment and helping you become more self-aware of your feelings, more embracing of your feelings, understanding what, you, you know, these patterns that maybe aren't serving you, how they're trying to protect you, what other options are. It's just tons of self-awareness. Really, really cool. Dr. Lev has also co-authored three books. Um, One is acceptance and commitment therapy for couples. She's going to tell us about these and it's, she's really great. She's super to the point, exactly what this is about, how it can help. So you're probably going to want something. I'm just telling you, you're going to want some of these books after she gets done. The second one is acceptance and commitment therapy for interpersonal problems. And then these, those ones are more for therapists, but she's saying in the episode, like so many people are into psychology now that you might (laughs) also want those, which is totally me. Um, And the third one is the interpersonal problems workbook, which, um, is for like more of the general public really, really cool. And guys, do you ever do workbooks? Do you ever do workbooks or do you just read? Because I mentioned this in the episode, but there it is like night and day difference, just reading a book and passively listening and actively pulling things out from inside of you, which is most of the work that I'm doing and higher in our mindset coaching is like, no, you gotta like actually identify like what's going on pull it out to be active. So I love that she made a workbook. Um, she's also the founder of CBT online. It's an online platform that connects people with online therapists who specialize in CBT. And then she has a bunch of courses, webinars, um, all of that kind of stuff. And she'll tell you all about that is like, um, narcissistic abuse, recovery, self-compassion, a bunch of things. So anyway, this is cool. Everybody, I'm like, everyone needs to hear this episode and understand some of the concepts she's talking about. So, so good. So we'll go ahead and jump in. Here is Dr. Abby Lev. Okay. So cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT, you're the director of the, um, Bay area CBT center. So yay. I'm so excited to talk to you and you're such a great expert and authority on this. I've heard of CBT probably some, some people listening have probably done it, um, or at least heard of it, but for someone who's ignorant like me, can you fill me in on what is cognitive behavioral therapy? Sure. Um, So the main difference between talk therapy and cognitive behavioral therapy is the idea that insight alone is not enough to create behavioral change. So I think all of us have the experience of like knowing that a habit that we're doing is causing us harm and isn't good for us. And we just keep doing it and doing it. Um, And so sometimes we could have insights about it or understanding about it. And yet it doesn't help us do something different. Right. So cognitive, we're all familiar with that experience, (laughs) (laughs) unfortunately. (laughs) So cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, you know, the more modern approach of it, like a third wave behavioral therapy takes into account a lot of Buddhist ideas. We do uh, experiential exercises where we help people relate differently with the mind. So we have thoughts, feelings, and sensations and, and core beliefs. Uh, And when our core belief gets triggered, so I work with schemas and schemas are core beliefs and relationships. And I could give you some examples like an abandonment schema is a core belief that I will be abandoned in relationships, right? Mm -hmm. Or a mistrust abuse schema is a core belief that others will use me or abuse me that I can't trust them. If I have a subjugation schema, the belief there is that if I make my needs a priority in relationships, I will be abandoned or retaliated against, right? There's a self-sacrifice schema where there's a lot of feelings of guilt. If you put your own needs ahead of others or you make yourself a priority, you feel uh, selfish. Uh, There's an entitlement schema, which is kind of the opposite of that, right? And the the most common schema, because I have a schema questionnaire on my website, the most common one that I get is perfectionism. So we're all huge perfectionists with unrelenting standards. We put such high standards on ourselves um, that we always feel not good enough. 
And so I work with these core beliefs. When one of these core beliefs gets triggered for us in our adult relationships, what happens is it, it triggers and activates our, our whole system. And so we have automatic uh, uh, thoughts, right? And uh, like the, the somatic experience, sensations, physiological sensations, and strong, powerful feelings that all function when we're triggered to try to get us away from this pain, to not be abandoned. So if I don't want to be abandoned, I may do certain behaviors to avoid abandonment. Maybe I seek excessive reassurance. I start calling you, where, where are you? Are you leaving me? Where have you been? Do you love someone else, right? And the more that we engage in those old behaviors with these core beliefs, we create this self-fulfilling prophecy that actually ends up confirming the very thing that we fear. So okay. we'll keep going. No, no, no. Go ahead. I was going to say, like, I'm so curious about this because, yeah, I definitely uh, am familiar with the, the perfectionist doing health and mindset coaching work with people and like self-compassion has had to become such a huge part of my work. And I, I think this is such an awesome, awesome. I'm so excited to hear more because like, I think we're at a place where psychology is becoming a little bit more mainstream and people are following like psychology accounts. And so these awarenesses are starting to happen. Like, Oh, I have anxious attachment or, Oh, like I have a fear of this, or I have this belief, but then that's it. Like, they don't know how to not have it, where to go from there. So I'm excited to hear how exactly cognitive cognitive behavioral therapy, like what are they, how do you help? You know, where do you, once you have the awareness, it's like, right. it's, it's frustrating almost. Cause if you don't have the tools on how to get past it, you're just like, cool. <laughs> it's, it's very true. If you don't have the tools, you kind of see it all. You see your habits, you, you become more mindful and you don't know what to do differently. And it is really frustrating. And I think that now that psychology is becoming more mainstream, it's really important for us to, um, you know, make sure that we're not misinforming people or misrepresenting things that people really are understanding um, uh, what's behind these concepts. Because if we're not understanding what's behind these concepts, it could feel really over pathologizing, right? Frustrating, okay. over pathologizing. We feel like something's wrong with us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And almost like um, identity with it of, oh, I have fear of abandonment or, or shaming about it, you know, like, oh gosh, be better. Why do you have a fear of abandonment? Stop having a fear of abandonment. You know what I mean? That kind of right. mentality is what I see come up sometimes. So, so, right. you know, what does somebody experience when they're doing CBT to help get past this awareness? Yeah. So what we do is we work on changing your relationship with these thoughts, feelings, sensations, and internal experiences. So we live in a world, unfortunately, that gives us a lot of mixed messages about what is in our control and what isn't. So for example, we could hear things like, don't worry about it, calm down, relax. Like nothing is gonna make somebody more anxious or upset than somebody saying to them, relax. Right. And so we have learned that when we have certain internal experiences, thoughts, feelings, sensations, memories, we try to kind of get rid of them. And the more we try to struggle and avoid and control what's inside, the worse it gets. Because our internal experiences are radically different from objects in the world. So if I have a pen, you know, this pen makes me anxious. I could put this pen in the garbage and never see it again. Or if my phone makes me anxious, I could pick it up and get rid of it. But my thoughts and my feelings and my experience are in me. And so we help people notice that we could, we do experiential exercises so that our mind, for example, um, becomes more of our friend and our feelings become more of a guide of what we want to be about. And we identify values of what we want to stand for, and what direction we're moving towards. And so any thought, feeling, or sensation, when we help people relate to this experience differently, our thoughts are no longer having as much influence on our actions. We get a freedom of noticing, for example, if I have a self-sacrifice schema, I have a core belief that other people's needs are more important than my own. I'm bad or I feel guilty if I make my needs matter. Mm -hmm. 
So now if my friend says to me, hey, could I borrow your car? I then have feelings of guilt. My heart starts racing. And then I go, I'm really selfish. And my friend goes, I really need to get to this job interview. If I don't, if you don't lend me your car, I'm not going to get this job. And I'm feeling more and more guilty. And then I go, yes, you could borrow my car. And then my feelings of guilt go away. And then the next time she wants to borrow something, it's back. And then I keep doing something I don't want to do. And then I end up feeling more guilt. I also feel resentful. I feel like my, my relationship is not fair. I don't trust myself because I'm doing things I don't want to do. Now, when you help somebody build a different relationship with guilt and with their mind, now they have a freedom of choice to move towards what matters and to be able to say many different things, not just yes. Because then we're faced with somebody asking us for something and we could notice all of these different experiences without them pulling us towards old behaviors. Mm, I love this. Yeah. Feelings are our friends and they're, they're little alerts, you know, that it's like the, the lights coming on in your car, let, just letting you know there's something going on here, you know, and I love this. And I'm curious. So like, you know, we talk about the self-sacrifice schema, Clearly, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming, you know, usually those things have roots in childhood, but in CBT, you're not exactly just like going back to childhood. You can deal with the situation right now as in that car situation and, and see and allow those feelings, welcome those feelings and give solutions in the present of other options besides just feeling guilt and acting out of those automatic reactions that have been going on so long. Correct. Am I understanding that correct? Oh, absolutely. You're definitely understanding that correctly. So any feeling that we have, we can ask ourselves, what has this guilt stopped me from doing? Like, have any of these thoughts or feelings ever tried to stop you or stopped you from something important? So for example, guilt may act as a barrier, may try to stop me from asserting myself or saying no or advocating for myself or anger may try to stop me from being curious, being open, being present, mm. um, right? Or, or shame. Shame often tries to stop us from being authentic, from being vulnerable, from being honest. And so we could notice uh, that we have the same choice to move towards authenticity, even when our shame is at an 80% or 90%. Like I could feel anger at a 99% and still behave in a way that's kind and in a way that's open and curious. So as long as you know we do certain exercises like self-compassion, emotion exposure, we do diffusion techniques. Diffusion is making distance from the content of our mind. Uh, and these exercises help people be able to move towards what, what these thoughts and feelings have stopped them from doing before. Mm, I love that. I'm actually reading a, a psychology book right now on internal family systems. And this is kind of reminding me, it's like, I just did an exercise with it this morning since I'm reading that book. And it was like, you know, what are you feeling right now? And I noticed some anxiety I was feeling about a particular situation in my life. And it's that same kind of principle of like just asking it questions and being curious about it, you know, and welcoming it and, and being kind to those thoughts inside of us instead of don't feel like that. Don't feel like that. Don't feel like that. Don't bad, 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 ignore, 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 you know? And it was beautiful. Right. I actually learned some really deep stuff about myself just from being like, why are you feeling anxious about that? Huh? You know, there's a lot of juice under there. So it, it kind of reminds me, it's just a similar um, approach of being um, more welcoming to the feelings that we're having so that we can learn from them. Because I feel like otherwise it's when we're rejecting them, we, it just continues on and on and on. We never, ever learn anything from those feelings that we're having. So I love this I, approach. Um, well, I think you're, you're making a really interesting um, comparison here because schema therapy, right? The, the therapy that I do with schemas is very similar to internal family systems in the sense that we have these different parts of ourselves, right? There's all of these core beliefs. And when you take a schema questionnaire, there, there we could get information about particular schemas that could show us some form of personality disorder or, or characterological issues. So for example, if I see a schema questionnaire and all of the all of the schemas are very high, and the top ones are entitlement, um, defectiveness, shame, 
uh, and a mistrust, abuse, or abandonment, it's showing me that it may be some narcissism there. Yeah. Whereas if 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 there's a schema questionnaire and everything is really high, and the top ones are defectiveness, shame, abandonment, and deprivation, that shows that there may be some borderline characteristics there. We could see a little bit of a flavor of codependency. So there's a way that when we take this questionnaire, we, we see all the different pieces of ourselves and also like a main narrative of how they all play together. But what's interesting about schemas is that they're not true about us. So all of these different parts of ourselves, like we have messages from our early childhood. Um, so if I have a mistrust abuse schema, most likely my parents were not trustworthy, right? We're not reliable. It was adaptive for me not to trust them. Mm -hmm. And now it's like, a schema is like a pair of sunglasses that I've learned in my whole life that I've developed. And now I have these shades and I see the world through these schemas. Um, and my behaviors, my thoughts and feelings are all coming from this lens that I don't know that I have. And part of the work we do with clients is to not look through the schemas, but be able to look at the schemas like this, like, oh, what happens for me? Like, how do I filter the world? And what are my core beliefs? What are my predictions about what this person will do? Like, right. if I do this, they will do this. And we start looking at the, the glasses instead of from. And the clearer we are about the way that these glasses shape the world, the more freedom we have to not do the behaviors that continue to confirm these beliefs. Mm. This is awesome. Yeah. It's I, I've learned in my in my own self that when I start exhibiting some behavior that seems uh, interesting to me, I'm like, what's why am I doing that? What's going right. on there? You know, like uh definitely my roots would be more like the, the codependence, uh like people pleasing, right. you know, that kind of that was definitely my pattern from childhood. And I'll, you know, it's like, okay, well, I've done really great. With my friends, I don't feel that way, but with my kids, I still see those patterns pick up. Like, why am I just like, just because you guys want to go do that right now, that doesn't even make sense, but it's like these <laughs> like old patterns, you know? So I love that about the sunglasses and like just being, just even understanding that we have that, that we have these lenses we're seeing life through that we don't even know are there. It's so, right. oh, I love, I love psychology. I love, you know, I was talking to my kids about therapy because my 14 year old son was like, therapy's for losers. It's for messed up people. <laughs> I'm like, no, people who don't go to therapy are losers. <laughs> like, if you're not doing anything, to marvel at yourself and learn about yourself and why you do right. what you do and optimize your mindset. Like that's loser to me. <laughs> Just agreed so agreed <laughs> i'm just saying it's cool you know it is so fun i think the human body is similar as like the human psyche it's just endlessly fascinating it's like the ocean yeah. there's always more to explore and discover so i love all this and i want to um kind of transition to this because you have some books that i really want to get into um the the first one is acceptance and commitment therapy for couples can you tell us what acceptance and commitment therapy for couples is? What do you mean there? So I've, I've kind of developed my own treatment, which is a cognitive behavioral therapy approach, and it integrates acceptance and commitment therapy and schema therapy. So these two type and, and somatic approaches as well. So it, it's, it's an approach uh, where we identify our core beliefs, and we clarify our values of what we want to be about. Mm. And we do these exercises um, that help us kind of get freedom from our minds and make friends uh, with our feelings. So it's, it's like when you were talking about kind of pushing those feelings away and making friends with them, you know, one metaphor that we have is that like all of our experiences are kind of like a crying baby mm -hmm. and if a baby starts crying it's like right in our face and we may want to go oh stop crying that's so loud it's so annoying but we wouldn't do that with a baby mm -hmm. we would bring the baby closer and we would go what's going on it makes sense that you feel scared and it makes sense that you feel helpless uh, and, and it makes sense you feel deprived and confused it's okay and we're very loving and tender and open to it and we, we, the work that I do is helping people be able to do that with their internal experiences, because I see all of us as, you know, little, little babies and adult bodies walking around, getting triggered and really needing that, 
reparenting, like needing that mirroring, needing to be taken care of in the way that most of us have not been taken care of in, in our childhood. Yeah. And you know, I, I say that a lot of my health coaching, I'm like, we're just big babies and toddlers that grew up, but we, we respond well to all the same kind of nurturing bedtime routines and like eating healthy food, like all of it where we really are just them. And I, you know, I love what you're saying there. Cause I found that as we like give ourselves what we wanted through these kind of approaches as, as babies, as toddlers, as kids, as teenagers, as we give that to ourselves, I have found that it's actually really healing in like our parent parental relationships, because we are no longer like, please give that thing to me. See, you never give that thing to me. I want you to tell right. me that I'm the best or that you're proud of me. But when you're starting to do this to yourself and be like, dude, I am so proud of you. You don't need that from them anymore. You're able to see them from a place of compassion and be like, dude, you're just doing the best that you can. And actually I can see that you're hurting and needed some things too, you know? So it's like right. do that healing work ourselves. It's so it's it like, I've just witnessed it make relationships blossom because you're no longer like, I call it like using people, using people to right, build right. A yourself that you're not <laughs> feeling, you know? So I love that. And, and in couples, I like that you hit on values, identifying what your values are. How often do you notice that like people know what their values are before they do this? Work? It's very rare. It's very <laughs> difficult to identify values. It's a very long process. Um, a couple of exercises that I do with couples, for example, is I'll have them write down uh, write down all of the things that you just can't stand about your partner, like everything that you want them to change, right? Uh, uh, maybe they they complain too much or you like whatever you would want them to change. So you, if you want a massage every day, if you want to be listened to compassion, empathy, just write down as much as you can about how you would want them to be different. And then I have them turn that paper over and I ask them now imagine that everything that you wanted your partner to change is now changed. They're the perfect partner. They listen to you. They give you massages. They're supportive. They're collaborative. They're caring and compassionate. How would you be behaving different in this relationship? And so what I want them to start noticing is that we have the same choice to start behaving in this way, regardless of whether the other person changes or not. So whether that person is being kind or not, I still can be kind. Whether that person is listening to me or not, I could still be empathic. I could still be compassionate. And I help client uh, couples uh, notice um, that their values are not about, they're not contingent on their partner. We don't move towards the kind of partner we want to be. Um, uh, because, because we want our partner to change. Yeah. We do it because that's what we want to be about because that's a free choice. Um, and that actually the more we move towards our values, it makes it easier for us to make decisions about whether we want to stay in the relationship or not. So as long as I'm not consistent with my values, I also have couples rate and track their consistency with values. Mm. So if I'm rating myself of honesty, I'm 20% out of 100% of honest. Compassion, I'm 25% out of 100% compassionate. Let's say my partner is 30% out of 100% compassionate. I'm being um, collaborative at a 20% and they're being collaborative at a 10%. As long as I continue to score really low, I'm always going to be wondering, is this something wrong with my relationship? Is it that I'm with the wrong person? Or is it that they're not compassionate because I'm not compassionate? Is it because I don't get my needs met because I'm not being honest? I'm not being assertive. I'm not being expressive. Or is it that my partner's just not willing to meet my needs? So as long as we are not moving towards our values. So when I work with couples, I say, we're going to look, we're going to track it for the next three weeks. You're going to rate yourself and you're going to rate your partner, but you're only going to focus on yourself. So get yourself up to 80s first. And when you're all 80s, then let's see where your partner's at. Mm. Maybe they're also at 80s. Maybe they're also at 90s. Or if they're still at a 10% or 20%, at least now you have information. You know that whatever you do, this the, they don't change and it's still the same. But as long as we're not moving forward, inconsistency with our own values we're always ambivalent and we can't make an informed decision about whether to stay or go mm, I love this so much it's uh 
a lot of accountability, a lot of getting out of victim mindset, a lot of getting out right. of finger pointing. And um, I've definitely noticed how we treat ourselves is how we treat others. And it's kind of funny sometimes. I'm sure you've seen it, but I've noticed it. You know, I love my clients to death. I definitely won't say any names or anything too particular, but I've noticed in relationship issues, the things that they're saying that they don't like about their partner. I'm like, well, no wonder you guys hooked up because you're the exact same way. Right, right, <laughs> kind of what right. I'm, thinking. I'm like, you're really hard on yourself. You're really, you know, like very judgmental on yourself. You're very perfectionist, but I'm not going to say that, but you know what I, and, and as they start to heal those things in themselves, it's just crazy. It's just incredible to see how their relationships blossom. It's all of a sudden they're being more self-compassionate. Oh, they're being more compassionate on the partner. They're being more fun, expressing fun in their life. They're seeing how fun their partner is, you know? So it's, I love that you're bringing it back into the self, but also at the same time with together with your partner. And I love that it's with couples because sometimes I'm like, gosh, I don't know if I, how I feel about coaching people if we're going to be diving into relationship stuff without your partner doing it, they get them on here too. That's not fair. <laughs> so I love that. Okay. Let's shift this over to your other book, acceptance and commitment therapy for interpersonal problems. So how does this twist from the couples book? This one, um, is more for individuals. So we help the individual. There's like a whole program. So the book will help you uh, take the quiz, know what your schemas are. And then we help you identify your values in all different domains. So what do you want to be about as a mom? What do you want to be about as a partner? What do you want to be about in your relationships, in, in your friendships, in your, in your work relationships? So we have different domains. We help you clarify all of the values and the values are like a compass. That's why I have a compass here because they're guiding our behaviors. So they're, they're not a destination. They're the journey. Meaning if I have a value of being honest, I'm never a hundred percent honest, right? I'm just every moment and every decision I make either moves me closer to the kind of person I want to be or further away from what I, I want to be about in this relationship. And so we help people, the book will help you identify all of your values in different domains. And then we move into identifying the barriers. What are the thoughts? What are the feelings? What are the sensations? What tries to stop you from taking this specific behavior? Mm. So, you know, the reason I'm a cognitive behavioral therapist is because I'm very behavioral. I think that there's no, there's not much point in understanding too much. Like you were saying, it's frustrating. If we don't actually change something, if we don't know what we have to change and what that looks like, it's, we feel very helpless. Right. So a lot of my work is what needs to change? What does it look like? If you, it's very easy to move towards one particular value. If I just want to be honest, that could be easy. Somebody could go, does this dress look nice on me? And I could go, no, you look like crap. But if I have a set of values, if I want to be kind, I want to be assertive, I want to be honest, I want to be empathic. Now I have to think about what behavior is in alignment with all of these values and what do I want to move towards? And we bring mindfulness and intention into what we want to be about. So the book will help people really clarify all of the barriers and then do specific exercises and experiential techniques to be able to get through those barriers and into the new behavior. I I love, I can I, I love what you're about and I love your approach because <laughs> it's, I, <laughs> I always tell my clients, I'm like, if, if you're just listening to books, that's really cool. If you're just listening to podcasts, that's cool. But like, there is, that is like a, a 1% effective, like it's 1% as effective as actually like answering a question about yourself and right, pulling right. something at, from outside of you and having to be active versus just passive. Like, well, this is really cool stuff, but it, everything you're, everything you're doing, it's all about, nope. What do you value? What is blocking you? Like identify it. Right. And that is, and, and it's so it's like, behavioral. Yeah. Like, be, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? What are you going to be about? How do we move yeah. towards this? Yeah. 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 It's really cool. It's like a, a blend of 
therapy and coaching. You know what I mean? Like, cause like a lot of times I, at least from what I, I'm not a therapist, but a lot of it is like discovery, self-discovery, finding out what's going on inside of you. And coaching is a little bit more like implement, implement, implement. And this is like both, which is really cool. Yeah. <laughs> very, very present moment, very implementing. And even in the moment with my clients, I, you know, if they get triggered, I ask them, what do you want to be about in this moment right now? And I could even say, you know, what you're the behaviors that you're doing right now, like I have an urge to to move back or I'm having like this feeling of distance and I still want to move towards my values. So I'm going to be open. I'm going to be curious. I'm going to stay present with you. I'm going to stay connected. I model for them what it looks like for all of our thoughts, feelings, sensations, and urges to go, no, I don't want this. And then still be able to move towards our values because when we can relate to our experiences differently, when we could go, it makes sense. That I feel scared. And, and, and when our when our feelings and our thoughts are not our enemy, then we have all of this freedom of uh, th- this problem solving place where we could know what our needs are and negotiate, know what our ideal situation is, what we won't tolerate. We could really move towards getting these needs met because we're focused on values and not on running from pain. I don't want to have this feeling. Right. So good. It's kind of like it implements so many things at the same time. Cause it's, it's also really helps with boundaries when you know what your values are, like you're, you've identified what matters to you. So it's like easier to make choices because you know what you value, not, I don't know, I guess I'm just going to go with whatever my subconscious <laughs> sunglasses tell me to do, you know? Um, I, I hit one more thing on values, one more question for you on values. Cause you've brought them up so much. Like Values is such an interesting thing to me because I have noticed it it, it, sometimes, you know, it's a, it's not a constant uh, uh, topic in my mindset coaching, but when we do talk about it, I've noticed that sometimes people like they're, they, they're saying they value things that they're supposed to value, but (laughs) it's not really what they actually are exhibiting that they value. Like I value my family. I'm like, I've never heard you talk about your family. That dude values his family. All he ever talks about is family. He's showing me his granddaughter, his granddaughter all the time. Like I can tell that dude values his family. I don't know about you. I didn't even know you had a family. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? So like, have you found that we're like kidding ourselves about what we do value? So when we're kidding ourselves about what we value, what we're doing is, is often we're moving away from pain. So for, I'll give you an example. Um, I'm, 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 uh, I, have a, I have a client, she's, she has an abandonment schema. So she's very, right, the belief is that she's going to be abandoned. And when we talk about her values with her partner, she goes, I have a value of being accepting. So when her partner is being mean or hurtful, right, or if she has a sense that she's going to be abandoned, she's like, what I want to do is just accept it. Now, we could notice that that's not a true value, right? Uh-huh. Are you moving Are you moving towards acceptance because it's a free choice because you want to be a partner who's accepting? Uh-huh. Or do you want to be accepting because that's the what your mind is telling you as a way to avoid abandonment? Right, right. And so a lot of the values work, you're hitting it right on the, on the head. Is that the saying? <laughs> right. Um, is that a lot of that work is parsing out. What are the rules? What is what you think you should do? What is actually schema avoidance behaviors masquerading as values? Mm. And so every, every time a client does a new behavior, I ask them, did you, what are the values that this is moving you towards? And if they're not clear, Um, I always ask, is this about moving away from something or moving towards something? Mm -hmm. Because values are always about moving towards something, Mm -hmm. never about moving away. So I I would ask my client, I would say to her, if we imagine that your partner would never abandon you, is just let's imagine we have like some sort of, I don't voodoo and they will never leave. What values would you want to stand for? Would you want to be accepting when you feel hurt, when you feel angry? What would you want to be about in those moments if they would never leave you? Mm, Very good. Yeah, yeah. Values as almost like trauma responses. And you're helping people understand that it's not that you're getting past that and and dissecting that a little bit. Very, very cool. I love this. Okay. um, You also have your interpersonal problems workbook. Can you tell us about that? Yeah. 
So uh, the interpersonal problems workbook and the act for interpersonal problems is the same treatment, but one book is geared for therapists and the other is geared for, right, like everyday people. Mm -hmm. So if you are, you know, in the mental health field or you're a coach, you would probably want to get act for interpersonal problems, meaning the one for uh, helping professionals. And if you're, if you're not a helping professional, you'd want to do the interpersonal problems workbook. But I think sometimes even because psychology is so popular right now and everybody's really yeah. getting into it, you yeah. don't have to be a mental health professional, right? To read the, that version. Yeah. 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 A friend of mine has a podcast on shame and she was sending me, you know, I was like, what's, I was asking her stuff. She's like, well, I have this book, but it's like literally a textbook <laughs> for mental health, but, but I got it. I got it anyway. Because yeah, there's a lot of us who are very fascinated, like, what's what's going on especially if we're in any sort of coaching or helping role like this so yeah I, I I agree like some of us might want to go all the way but I love that you have something more for like okay I'm not a therapist like help me with these things so that's so awesome and then I also wanted to just mention that you're the founder of CBT online which is really cool so that is to connect online therapists with people or can you tell us about CBT online Yeah. So CBT online is a platform where we uh, connect people with a therapist and online therapist. Uh, And I also offer, we offer online courses and webinars and courses that have CE credits for therapists Um, course it like I have a nonviolent communication course because I love nonviolent communication. Um, There's a course on um, uh, surviving narcissistic abuse Uh, There's a course on attachment styles, integrating schemas for attachment styles. Um, And so there's also questionnaires like the schema questionnaire, self-compassion questionnaire. Uh, We have worksheets. So you could go on there and and do these kinds of values um, exercises on your own. Uh, And and I have the logs that you could type in all all of the answers uh, right on uh, the the website. So it's it's a place where you can either use this with your therapist or we could find you a therapist that you could use it with. Or also you could use these things on your own. Those are amazing resources. Do you kind of want to coach Will Smith after the (laughs) incident? (laughs) Will, we got somebody for you, bro. We love you, Will. We got somebody for you. (laughs) You know, I I don't think that I I wouldn't want to coach Will Smith in this scenario. I would want to coach the the system that allowed for that to happen, right? Yeah. 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 Good point. And that's guys, that's cbtonline.com. If you want that, I love that you, you said you had a narcissistic abuse one self-compassion. I'm so I'm pretty obsessed. I'm, you've probably read uh, Kristen Neff's book, self-compassion. I'm like so obsessed. With yes. Self-compassion. I've met her. You have, I want, I want to, I She's think so awesome. it's, it's really beautiful when you meet someone who, you know, does this work and also walks the walk. They don't just talk the talk, you know, I, it's really important for me. Like I try to really, um, you know, embody it and not just talk it, but it's, it's, so I find her to be such a, a warm heart and you just feel how warm hearted and compassionate she is. So it's, it's beautiful when we could actualize the things that we yeah. believe. Yeah. And it helps you definitely like that's with me with, you know, health coaching and I'm like, if I can't, if I can't manage being a single mom, four kids and staying healthy, then how can I help other people? So it's, it's, it's actually a wonderful position to be in too. Cause it's like, oh, I get to share all the insights I'm learning with other people. Yay. You know? So yeah, I love, well, I love hearing that about Kristen and I love all of the resources you have built. Those are all incredible. Um, so guys make sure you're, so your um, CBT center in Bay area, if you guys want to know is Bay area, CBT center dot com. Yes. Got it. Okay. <laughs> be online and we'll link up all the books in the show notes. Is there anything, you know, like I always have these like stirrings in my heart that are kind of like the thing that I'm like, just, gosh, I just, if I could just tell people, uh, do you have anything like that, that you just want to leave with our audience today? Just stuff that's been stirring in your heart that you feel would be not, like helpful for people to hear in closing. Well, it was in relation to what you were just sharing about how um, there's something about the way that you help yourself also helps others, right? Like Pema Chodron talks about this idea of bodhicitta, the idea of 
awakening our own heart and our own learning for the purpose of all other beings. Mm. And so I feel really touched when I see people doing that. And I really um, connect with that, like the idea that we're all in this together. Yeah. Uh, all, all of this pain is universal. Like we've, we, all humans have this pain. Me making friends with this pain will help you make friends yeah. with this pain. You making friends with this pain will help others. And we're kind of interconnected in this way. And so I have a wish for all of us to be more intentional in, in our everyday lives and, and really feeling that more. Mm, I love that. Thank you. One of my favorite quotes is from Leo Tolstoy. And he says, every man, it's something I'm paraphrasing, but it's like, everyone thinks of changing the world, but no one thinks of changing himself. And I love that because it's just like, it's true. That's all you have to do. All you have to do is heal and love yourself and become healthier. And like, and it's just the ripple effect. It leads to the collective, like rising. Right. Because it's just your ripple effect. We're all affecting each other all the time. So I love that so much. Thank you. Thank you for taking the time. I know you're so busy. Thank you for coming on and sharing with my audience today. And we'll, link everything up and hopefully some of you guys can partake of some of the resources that you have so wonderfully put together and um yeah just appreciate the work you're doing it's freaking awesome i'm like yeah cbt now (laughs) so thanks for sharing that with me as well and yeah just appreciate your time thank you I, i had a good time chatting i appreciate your energy thanks